Hello, Trinity Tigers. Welcome to Learning Together, a live webinar series that's part of Lifelong Learning Initiatives presented by Trinity University's Alumni Relations and Development. I'm Aisha Salton, class of 1996. I'm a syndicated columnist based at the St. Louis Post-Dispatch. Trinity, Trinity's Office of Alumni Relations has invited me to moderate this seminar. So we will be discussing tonight Loneliness in a Lonely Time, Reasons for Hope. It's my distinct pleasure to introduce the webinar panelists in the order of their appearance. We'll hear from Dr. William Ellison, an assistant professor of psychology at Trinity University. He teaches courses in psychopathology, personality, and statistics and research methods. Dr. Erin Sumner is an associate professor of human communications at Trinity. Her research focuses on the role of computer medi mediated communications like social media and online dating in social and personal relationships. And finally, we'll hear from Dr. Kelly Gray Carlisle, an associate professor of English at Trinity. She teaches creative writing, editing and publishing and first year experience courses. Carlisle's memoir is titled, We Are All Shipwrecks. Now human beings possess an innate need for social connection and belonging. And we are all prone to experience loneliness when those needs go unmet. Loneliness, such a common affliction, is associated with so many physical and mental conditions, like high blood pressure, heart disease, obesity, a weakened immune system, anxiety, depression, cognitive decline, Alzheimer's disease, and even death. Fortunately, there are many strategies for combating loneliness and fostering a sense of connection that can buffer us through difficult times like the ones we're in now. Our panelists will discuss loneliness using both humanistic and social scientific approaches derived from their fields of study. So with that order in mind, let's first turn to Dr. Bill Ellison, who will share his, perspe his perspective drawn from his research and study in the field of psycho psychology. Dr. Ellison. Good evening, everyone. Um, it's very nice to be here, and I'm uh, glad to be included in this panel. Um, and I represent uh, psychology, um, which is kind of an interesting, uh, has an interesting take on loneliness. Um, as Aisha was saying, loneliness um, is a universal experience. We all have a sense of what it means to be lonely and how it feels. Um, and so, you know, it's a very important topic, but um, it's, it's funny, it's very poorly understood. Um, from a psychological perspective, uh, despite how common it is, and despite the fact that we all have, um, you know, a pretty good um, basic understanding of what it feels like, um, as the science goes, it's it's not very well understood. Um, we know a couple of things. We we know that um, certain kinds of people um, are especially prone to loneliness, or people in certain circumstances. So. Um, people who live alone, for example, um, people with uh, chronic diseases, uh, including severe mental illness, uh, are often very prone to loneliness. Uh, people who uh, are poor uh, or unemployed um, and uh, people who are employed in certain kinds of industries, um, such as uh, migrant workers and gig workers and other people whose jobs don't really bring them into contact with uh, other people regularly. Um, but one of the things about those studies, all the sort of um, knowledge that I've just uh, hinted at, is that the studies are not very reliable. Um, many studies uh, suggest that those kinds of people are uh, prone to loneliness, but other studies disagree. And uh, it's really hard to get uh, a sense, a reliable sense of who is going to be lonely and who's not. Um, and in recent years, there's been a lot of speculation about uh, young adults and loneliness and studies of loneliness on college campuses. So um, people who are in college now, uh, for example, Generation Z, uh, have been reporting a lot of loneliness, uh, more than was typical when I was in college. Um, but it's also pretty hard to understand what that means because uh, this generation is facing a lot of other problems. and. Um, has a lot of other uh, sort of different perspectives on mental illness that was not true uh, when I was in college. Um, and so um, the meaning of that finding is really not clear either. Um, 
So one basic problem about loneliness from a psychological perspective um, is that it, it probably feels very different uh, and functions very different for different people, despite the fact that we all seem to know what it is. Um, if you ask a lot of people, you'll get a lot of different answers about what loneliness really boils down to. And we were talking about this um, before. We were um, discussing what to, what to speak about today. Um, and we were talking about how we were experiencing the pandemic. Um, and um, I know a lot of extroverted people. For example, my, my neighbor is just going stir crazy um, in her house. Um, during quarantine especially, but not being able to have the holiday parties and the um, kind of gatherings that she's used to um, is really bugging her. Um, and you can tell that she really um, feels lonely in this circumstance. And I'm more of an introvert and I am doing fine. Uh, it really doesn't affect me much at all. In fact, in some ways, um, I'm more connected now than I was before the pandemic started because there's a big push for me to get in touch with friends over Zoom or other um, kind of video conferencing apps. And I wouldn't have been in touch with them if we um, had more of an active in-person social life. So it really, it affects people in different ways and, and sometimes in surprising ways. It's very subjective. I, in fact, in, in psychology, there's really not a consensus definition of the phenomenon of loneliness. If you read five papers, you'll probably get six different definitions of what the thing is. So um, it, it's really hard to ask about um, and get a handle on as it relates to people in general. Um, probably the thing we understand best about loneliness, and this is something Aisha was talking about, is um, the opposite of loneliness, the feeling of connection with other people. And that we do know a lot more about. Um, we know, for example, that being connected to other people really requires two different things. One is um, a view of other people uh, that includes a, likely, a likelihood that they're gonna offer a connection, that they're gonna be available for support, for example, an expectation that they're gonna be there for us when we need them. And the second thing uh, that we need to feel connected in general is a view of ourselves as worthy uh, for other people to make connections to. And those two views, the view of other people as providing support and, and care and connection and the view of the self as worthy of that connection, uh, those views run very deep and they come uh, about in early childhood and through just the thousands and thousands of repetitions of bids for connection that we make, um, not just with our caregivers like our parents and grandparents, but also friends and family. And as we grow up, you know, our uh, close friends and romantic partners. And so those views kind of get reinforced over and over and lead to a feeling of connection, even when the people we care about are not physically there. And that's why a lot of people can feel very connected uh, to other people and not lonely at all uh, when they're sitting in a room by themselves. And why other people uh, who might not have uh, those very core self views might feel lonely in a crowded room, even when they're being um, very social. Right? It would seem to an outsider that they're sort of uh, together with people. Um, so, you know, it, it sort of is an inner capacity to feel connection that really fosters a sense of, of being with people, even when you're by yourself. Um, so, I think for most people to feel connected, um, it actually doesn't take a whole lot. And it takes really just the occasional experience of, of kind of being listened to about something that's personally relevant. Um, so there's a, a fascinating study that I, I love to talk about um, by Monisha Pasupathy uh, and her colleague, Ben Rich. This is about 15 years ago. And they did a study where they asked people to tell a story about themselves, something that happened to them recently. Um, just the kind of thing we would do um, any day of our lives, really, to a casual acquaintance or a friend. Um, and they had the person who was listening to this story do uh, one of three things. They would either act engaged, uh, they would act distracted, 
or they would actually disagree in the third condition with what the person was saying. And the feeling of connection, uh, it was there when the listener was acting engaged and was acting sort of attentive, but it was also there when the, the listener was disagreeing, when they were kind of actively uh, rejecting the story the person was telling, it still seemed to the, the storyteller that there was a feeling of connection there. Um, and the third group, the, the group uh, where the listener was disengaged, felt very disconnected and very doubtful of their own kind of self view. Um, and so it seems like the connection and the most acute loneliness seems to happen not when other people reject you necessarily, but when they disregard you or ignore you, when you're, especially when you're being vulnerable to them, you're telling them something that is important to you. When others don't view your story or your goals as kind of worth considering. Um, and so the sense of connection that I think really buoys us through hard times is pretty simple. It doesn't take a lot, just someone uh, to listen to you and um, engage. Um, and so I think that's, um, if I could make a prescription, that's kind of what I would say is most important uh, when we're all prone to feeling a little bit disconnected. Um, so um, that's pretty much all I know. As I said, it's a, a very uh, ill-defined field, but I hope uh, Dr. Sumner and Dr. Carlisle will have uh, more insight. Thank you. Actually, that was really fascinating. I think just hearing about the ambiguity in loneliness is really revealing and telling. And friends, before I hand it over to our next panelist, I would like to remind you that you'll be able to submit your own questions as you're listening. So if anything crosses your mind, just use the Q&A tab at the bottom of your screen. You'll see the little bubble there. And then I'll look through those and the panelists will be happy to answer the questions when we get to the Q&A portion. Now I want to present Dr. Erin Sumner, who's going to share her perspective on the subject from her research and study in the field. Okay, well, welcome everyone. Um, I love hearing uh, Dr. Ellison talk because again, it, it's so much connection between what we do in communication and psychology. Um, also some differences that I think you'll pick up on uh, in terms of what we f fundamentally focus on, right? Um, so coming from communication, I focus more on, um, well, communicative aspects of loneliness, right? So not necessarily how does it feel and how do we cognitively process it, but what are the communicative roots of it and also potential communicative cures for it? Um, and that's kind of where we're headed today. So foremost, noting that um, if we're going to understand loneliness, we really need to also understand the just how foundational our need to belong and connect are. So the idea that affection and social inclusion are not these fluffy things that like happen when all of our other needs are met. They're actually fundamentally human. Um, they promote physical and mental health in all the ways Aisha mentioned earlier. Um, and as affection and exchange theory tells us, they also help us survive and thrive. So many of you have probably learned Maslow's hierarchy of needs, the idea that look, first you have to have your needs for like water, food, like that met, followed by shelter, safety. Above that, we start caring about relationships. I would counter that, that actually our relationships and our inclusion actually are codependent with all of that. Why? Because, well, Here's some examples of human babies versus other species. We are born weak, helpless, right? It takes years just for us to be able to even, you know, somewhat approximate uh, getting by on our own. We don't leap forward at birth, ready to conquer the world on, on our own. Uh, we need connections to do that. Um, so we see that the more connections we have, the more likely we are to get shelter and all those things that we need, right? So um, basically placing relationships as foundational to the human experience and human survival um, and thriving in many ways. So in that sense, loneliness is really a normal human reaction to the perception that our needs for affection and inclusion are not being met. I think this word perception highlights a lot of what um, Dr. Ellison mentioned. We perceive that our needs for affection and inclusion are not being met. Um, there's some research from communication showing that perceptions are more important than actual behaviors. Um, so objectively speaking, you could try to count how many social support behaviors you have to a certain experience, and those matter less than how you perceive it. This is why, as, as Dr. Ellison noted, you can feel very lonely when others think you have support and or vice versa. 
Um, Dr. Corey Floyd, one of my mentors, has used the term deprivation to describe loneliness. And I think it's very fitting, that sense of being starved, right? Like I, I'm deprived of something that I need. And it really, again, uh, uh, underscores the way that this is not a fluffy extra thing that we want. It is a fundamental human need. Um, one of the things to know is that affection and um, really affectionate communication and, and other social behaviors um, have been studied in actual biological sense. So um, I mentioned Dr. Corey Floyd, he has, has a lab where he takes spit samples from people, gets them all stressed out and then puts them through a gauntlet of human communication behaviors to see how they react. And what he sees in his research is that both giving uh, affection and also receiving affection buffers our stress response. And I mean this in a very biological sense as well as a mental health sense. Um, so not only do we feel better, um, we actually get reduced cortisol levels. So, you know, people's cortisol levels spike when they're stressed. And he's done things like having people write a letter to somebody they love or have them get a hug from a friend. The simple behaviors like that lower cortisol responses versus people who are just sitting there not getting the affection, right? Um, so the big thing to know there is that while the stressor might persist, affection helps us cope. It helps us move forward, feel like we can conquer it in some way. Now, why does all that matter right now? Stress levels are high, I don't know about you. These are stressful times in every sense of the word. Uh, the economy, unemployment, uh, a health pandemic, I mean, you name it, things are crazy, crazy stressful right now. And our most basic instinct to connect as a buffer to stress is um, a fundamental social and personal health risk. So that's a fun thing to deal with right now, right? Kind of promotes a sense of cognitive dissonance in a way too, because what we want, and we also we realize it's bad, but we also want this and, and we don't quite know how to process that which adds even more stress, right? Um, so one thing to keep in mind here is that our normal communicative routines for accessing support and connection have been disrupted. Um, most of us kind of overlook how much our everyday lives are built um, in ways that provide our social needs. And the example I love to use here are like water cooler conversations. I miss these right now. I miss, you know, like I'm dealing with stress, you know, a stressful situation in my classroom maybe. And just walking down the hallway, usually I'd run into coworkers and those coworkers would talk me through it. And, and just talking to them made me feel better, right? Uh, I don't have that right now unless I seek it out. Um, so that, you know, despite all of this happening, an interesting thing that Dr. Ellison mentioned is that we're not really seeing an interest, like a, much of an increase in loneliness um, during COVID. There has been some studies that found it hasn't really increased at all, um, perhaps because of the complex experiences that we've had during this time that Dr. Ellison mentioned, but also because we are um, finding ways to use technology to combat our loneliness. Um, we're getting more creative with that. Uh, so most of my research actually looks at interpersonal communication and technology. And so I thought I'd do a real quick uh, Mythbuster sort of section on uh, what we hear about, you know, basically technology, loneliness, and well-being. I think there's a widespread social myth that uh, basically social media and technology are making us all lonely and destroying our mental health and, um, you know, the just the detriment of society. The thing to keep in mind here is that pretty much every technology ever has been scapegoated as the cause of a complex social issue like loneliness. Um, going back to writing as, yes, writing was one of the original forms of mediated communication, right? And why would anyone want to write or read? You can't hear the other person's voice. We were an oral society. This is horrible. It will be to the, to the destruction of all humanity. If we can just write and do things, who will even meet in person? Uh, same things happen with the telephone, uh, TV. Many of you remember the hysteria of TV and how that was gonna make everyone violent. We now know better with all those other channels and we're starting to see a very similar trends emerge when it comes to social media and other technologies. Um, lots of words on this slide. You can read them if you want, but the, the big thing to keep in mind here is that this is some of the most rigorous research being done and they're not really finding a lot of connection between mental well-being and technology. So I mentioned up here at the top, a study done by Jeffrey Hancock out of Stanford. They did a meta-analysis of well over 200 studies on this topic, um, basically everything they could find that's been done on this. Um, and they basically found these itty bitty positive relationships between using technology and your happiness and your relational functioning. So people who use more are actually slightly happier and have more, you know, better relationships, but they also have a small increase of anxiety and loneliness sort of a trade-off, but again, itty bitty little negligible effects um, that kind of at the top there, they countered, countered each other out. 
Oxford uh, Internet Institute also have found similar results. They did a, a massive study where they found that uh, depression was unrelated to technology use for, for boys. For girls, it was related and explained 0.04% of the variance. What does that mean? Picture a pie chart and picture which sliver like how big is the sliver of depression that is explained by technology? And then picture what 0.04% looks like. Um, in that same study, they found that that was the same exact effect size as eating potatoes had on depression. So again, it's not not there, it's simply very, very small and far less important than things like wearing glasses, not eating breakfast, being bullied, using drugs, other things. Um, just actually breaking this month, published in Journal of Computer Mediated Communication was a longitudinal study of German adolescents. Uh, so they did five data collections over nine years and found basically that there are no within or between subjects effects, which is basically just another way of saying they did not find connections between internet use and social media and well being in a longitudinal sense. So again, some really rigorous research. I think as um, Dr. Ellison already noticed or, or noted about um, this topic, when you look at all of the research, so like all of those 200 plus studies that Dr. Hancock looked at, th the results are like really inconsistent, but they're consistently small, <laughs> if that makes sense. Sometimes they find a relationship, sometimes they find positive, sometimes they find negative. And when you start cutting across it, things basically seem to be saying it's not that big of an effect. Um, we do need more nuance here. Um, and some of the uh, more nuanced things that we're seeing, social media use appears to have more detrimental effects on those who are already prone to anxiety, depression, and loneliness. So if you're already prone to those things, then sitting there and, and looking at social media might actually be more detrimental to you than somebody who's prone to be connected, right? I, and somebody might look at social media and see their, their friends, others might see uh, fear of missing out, those sorts of things. Um, another example would be people who mainly use social media to follow like influencers and celebrities they fare worse than those who approach social media um, to connect with people they know. So there's um, Dr. Ellison out of, um, well, different Ellison, Nicole Ellison uh, uses the phrase actual friends, like who are you connecting with? Um, and then lastly, basically uh, people who use social media more actively to socialize, right? To actually engage in positive relational behaviors tend to fare better than those who just kind of watch it and, and just kind of, watch it unfold. So again, tons and tons of um, questions there, but also noting that um, overall, we just, we're just not seeing a huge effect there. So the cool thing is that, again, we in normal times, um, we use technology very much to supplement our relationships. Um, the more you talk to somebody offline, the more likely you are to use more different channels to facilitate that connection. So closeness is actually related to technology use, not the opposite, which is something that is often uh, gotten wrong. Pandemic times, we actually are asking people to replace their physical interactions with technology, which is odd because usually we don't do that. Again, I think the big thing to keep in mind here is that we can't fall back on our everyday physical interactions and the um, swathes that that naturally seems to fulfill a lot of our social needs simply by running into people. It's kind of like retiring in a sense too, like when you retire, all those interactions that you didn't realize you were going to miss, suddenly you miss. And what that means is that we need to be more proactive and actually, as Dr. Ellison said, making those you know, appointments. You can't, you're not going to bump into your coworkers unless you reach out and say, hey, let's all get together in this virtual space or you text them, you do whatever. Um, but again, overall, we are seeing that a lot of people are getting creative and finding ways to connect in some ways better than ever as they use technologies. Again, I'm happy to answer any more questions on that, um, but I want to turn it over back to uh, Aisha and Dr. Carlo. Wonderful, thank you so much um, for that presentation. And I'm sure we're gonna have lots of questions about that um, in the Q&A. Now I wanted to introduce Dr. Kelly Carlisle, who's going to tell us about how reading and creative writing can help ease feelings of loneliness. Thank you, Aisha, and thank you all for being here in this sort of, um, simulacrum, I guess, of being together. We think of reading and writing as a lonely pursuit, something that needs to be done in quiet and solitude. But tonight I have a few thoughts about how reading and writing help us to feel less lonely, perhaps even to be less lonely. Um, one of the great things about being a creative writer who works at a university is that you work with some brilliant people as you just saw. And so in preparation for this talk, I asked my colleagues in the English department for ideas and book suggestions on this topic. And so at the end of this talk, I'll share in the chat 
a reading list as well as some writing prompts for you because I'm a writing teacher and I can't resist getting people to write. Um, so call it a loneliness syllabus, if you will. So as I was thinking about this topic, my colleague, Dr. Shaj Matthew, who studies global modernist literatures, brought my attention to a book called What We Talk About When We Talk About Books, A History of Reading by Leah Price. In it, she describes how reading wasn't always seen as this lonely, serious activity that was beneficial, um, like broccoli or high fiber cereal. Through the physical study of old books and the study of letters and diaries from previous times, we know that reading fiction used to be a social activity, one considered to be frivolous. Instead of imagining a lonely 18th century woman reading alone in her chambers, you might do better to imagine her sitting in a chair, having her hair done, while another servant read aloud the latest novel. Imagine the women laughing over a shared story. Of course, even in the time before the pandemic, reading in our era could also be a social event. I'm thinking of midnight release parties for Harry Potter books or toddler story time at the library, book clubs, literary festivals. Book clubs continue on Zoom, so also do book festivals. And one day we will all be reading together again. I wanna be clear that literature does not necessarily help us escape loneliness and that so much of literature is precisely about loneliness and isolation. In an interview, American fiction writer and essayist David Foster Wallace described fiction's relationship to literature this way. I'm pretty lonely most of the time and fiction's one of the few experiences where loneliness can be confronted and relieved. Drugs, movies where stuff blows up, loud parties, all these chase loneliness away by making me forget my name's Dave and I live in a one by one box of bone that no other party can penetrate or know. Fiction, poetry, music, really deep serious sex and in various ways religion, these are the places for me where loneliness is countenanced, stared down, transfigured, treated. In lots of ways, it's all there is. That phrase, a one by one box of bone, meaning the skull that no other body can penetrate or know. I love that image because it describes so perfectly the loneliness of being a human. And Dr. Ellison described how psychology doesn't have like one definition of being lonely. The thing about literature, right, is that there are a million descriptions and definitions and ways of being lonely. But that bone box, no one can truly and completely enter it, the skull of another. A kind of loneliness is the pain of not being known or seen or understood or knowing, seeing or understanding someone else. And since we cannot ever truly be known by another human, we are in some degree always lonely. I'll come back to that image in a moment. But again, literature is not an escape from loneliness, but where it is confronted and treated. Reading can help us experience heightened loneliness in order to accept and understand it. But as uncomfortable as that process it can be, it can also paradoxically let us know that we are not alone in our loneliness. It, but it is true that even when we read or write on our own, these activities have the power to connect us to other humans and to make us feel less lonely. It's an off-sighted truism that reading can help us encounter and connect with people across cultures, races, time, geography, gender. At the beginning of the pandemic, my colleague, Dr. Michael Fisher, published a wonderful short essay about reading's ability to connect us even as we show socially distance. As he wrote, works of literature help us learn about other people's lives by showing how different people see the world and interact with one another, what they say to each other, how they feel about themselves, what they notice, what they don't see. The American novelist Henry James described a great writer as someone on whom nothing is lost. That attentiveness can rub off on readers, sharpening our ability to understand others and to listen to them. 
reading literature over time does help us to become more responsive to others, more willing to let them count in our lives. And I would just add that this ability to connect to other people across difference, especially, seems vitally important right now, not just because of the pandemic, but of all the other issues we face politically and socially. Building on what Dr. Fisher describes, I've been thinking a lot about reading and writing and how they can be a profoundly intimate experience. I think that so what so many of us are missing right now is intimacy, the kind you get from being in proximity with another person over time, a lover certainly, but also a close friend, someone you work with every day, those water co cooler conversations. You get to see what that person sees, experience what they experience. You become privy to their thoughts, not just the deep ones, but their everyday quiet ones. You begin to understand them. You stand on the threshold of their one by one box of bone and even begin to enter. I have a walking buddy I miss deeply for this reason and Zoom just isn't the same. But through a novel or a memoir, especially one that follows closely a narrator, you can access that kind of intimacy with two other people, the narrator and the author. Through the author's use of details, the writer on whom nothing is lost, and your own imagination, you can experience the world as that character does. See the fissures of the bark of their favorite tree, listen to them worry about their children, smell the lanolin and campfire smoke on their sweater. We can achieve that intimacy with strangers through writing as well. So in my creative nonfiction class, we often begin the semester with an exercise where I ask my students to partner up with someone else in class, stare at them intently for three minutes and then draw their portraits. As you can imagine, at first it's incredibly awkward, all that eye contact. I ask them though, to pay attention to the physical details that make that person look like that person, to see them all and to try and get them all down on a page. That I tell them is what a writer does. Pay attention to the small details that make someone or a place or an event particular and distinctive. But I end the exercise by reminding them that to pay attention to someone is a way of caring for someone, of connecting with them. Paying attention is a form of love. And that becomes our goal for the course, to pay attention. A similar experience can happen to you if you go outside, take a notebook and people watch in a park. Pay attention to their small movements, the details of their appearance, how they play with their children. You'll still be strangers, but you'll feel connected, in love a little with the whole human family. And so I mentioned that reading about a person can help us to connect with them across time and geography. So too can writing. One thing my students consistently experience when they write memoir or personal essay is how much closer they can feel to a parent, sibling, or friend about whom they choose to write. This can be incredibly powerful as they reflect deeply on someone they might have taken for granted. I think all of us took those personal connections for granted before the pandemic. And so I'd suggest that you think about writing about a loved one from whom you are currently separated. Write about their face and their body, how their hand feels in yours, their memories and favorite things, the last time you spent with them, a special memory from the past. Finally, we can achieve that intimacy going the other way too when we write. Writing a letter to a close friend or writing an essay to an unknown reader is a way of opening that bone box of yours and letting another human inside. Writing about the unremarkable events of our day, sharing our stories and deepest hopes, describing the beauty of a walk through nature, our experience in the grocery store, help us to feel known and seen and connected and cared about. Finally, I want to close with an anecdote about how reading can make us feel less alone by providing a comforting sense of deja vu, the understanding that although an experience is novel and traumatic for us, 
it has been experienced by others before. We are not alone in our experience of this pandemic. And so just a few days before Trinity's campus closed in the spring, I checked out of the library, the English diarist Samuel Pepys journal from the year 1665, when a great plague hit London. And as I lay in my hammock this spring and summer, reading Pepys entries, plague London seemed so familiar. The rumors of a disease in another country, the first few cases, the steady rise, the death tolls printed in the newspapers, Peep's reluctance to enter crowded places, or this passage describing his wine cellar from near the beginning of the plague, July 7th, 1665. At this time, I have two tierces, which are big um, barrels of claret, two quarter casks of canary, and a smaller vessel of sack, a vessel of tent, another of Malaga, and another of white wine, all in my wine cellar together, which I believe none of my friends, my name now alive ever, have had at his own at a time. So I'm pretty sure our Samuel was hoarding wine. And if they'd had toilet paper and paper towels back then, perhaps he might've written about those as well. Reading his diary, I felt myself one human in a continuum of people over time and geography who'd grappled with disease, social disruption, mortality, and even shortages. And I thought I was alone in my peeps obsession, but slowly over the summer in the course of the pandemic, it became on parent on Facebook and other social media that many other people were also reading peeps. We'd all had the same idea. And suddenly we were all connected over time and space. Thanks. Thank you, Dr. Carlisle, that your sort of lyrical presentation was so emotional and moving. It made me feel connected to you and everybody in this seminar, um, made me feel less lonely <laughs> just to hear you talk about it. Um, and so before I open, we already have a few questions in the queue, but before I open for audience questions, I would like to ask each of you a question based on what you shared. Um, starting with Dr. Ellison, it was really fascinating to me when you said that it was the act of being uh, speaking to a distracted listener that created a sense of disconnection. And then you also mentioned that Gen Z is reporting higher levels of loneliness, which I have the same research that I've seen in the popular press. And I wonder if you could speculate as to the fact that because we all are so easily um, distracted, especially generations that have grown up native with a million, you know, managing a phone in their hand and a million devices at one time, that even um, whether there might be some correlation or some kind of connection to the fact that it seems harder to get someone's full attention right now. And especially if you've grown up that way and have not known what it's like to just have someone look in your eyes and not be distracted, even a parent, you know, I mean, our parents were not distracted in the way that we are now. So can you speak on that a little bit? It's a very interesting question. Uh, um, it would be pretty hard to speculate on the basis of, of that one study, but it's possible, I suppose, that um, if you have sort of a, a chronic experience of being um, unable to get someone's full attention when you're telling them something important, uh, that it might uh, lead to an increase in loneliness. But um, you know, it, it's hard to generalize from a single experience to what it might be like to have that experience repeatedly. I, I imagine that young people who, um, if they are more distractible, um, if they're digital natives and they have, you know, phones and gadgets and everything pulling their attention away from people who are physically in the same space, um, there must, I'm again speculating, but there, there might be some way that they're, uh, they learn to deal with it, that they find a connection despite the fact that they have all these other distractions. Um, as Dr. Sonny was saying, it's a fundamental human need. So um, I'm not sure if that would be uh, behind a rise in loneliness that young people might be experiencing, especially given all the other challenges that, that are right. sort of facing the generation, but it's a really interesting thought. 
Dr. Sumner, um, I wanted to ask you, I, I love how you debunked uh, a lot of the things that we hear commonly about social media driving rising rates of um, mental health challenges among young people, which are documented. And you're saying that that's not necessarily why that's happening. Um, in this moment though, especially when, you know, my teenagers have been in their rooms isolated for the better part of nine months, not in school. How can we replicate um, the connection that comes through proximity and touch that doesn't come? I mean, I feel like that is this intangible. I don't know how to give them right now. And maybe it's just, we, we have to do without. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's a challenge right now. When we talk about how people um, communicate affection and things like that, they do it verbally, non-verbally via touch. Um, touch is massive. I mean, you know, touch is a massive form of affection that is difficult right now, right? Unless you have people living in your household with you. Um, so, I mean, outside of using, you know, if you do, if you are fortunate enough to live with people, of course, um, then you can, you can do that, right? But if not, it, it is tough to replicate. I mean, it flat out is. I don't know of anyone who studies what I do in terms of communication technology that would argue um, that technology perfectly replaces face-to-face -face communication in the oh, sense yeah. of like, no, it's not the same as a hug. Um, but I do think that you can still feel connected um, using technology. And I think a perfect example of this would be um, as society has grown more and more mobile, many of us live remotely from people we care about. And we've been using technology as the sole, pretty much sole way of connecting with those folks for a very, very long time. Um, I, I mean, I mentioned in class so often, like, would you move across the country back in the days where that meant hopping a wagon and kissing your mother goodbye because you will literally never see her again. And maybe you'll get word sent from a traveler and, in, in, you know, got however many years. I would not. Um, as is, uh, especially during the pandemic, uh, my poor mother, she probably feels like I'm stalking her because I, I, I say it's like a reverse of when I was a teenager and she needed to check in on me and hear my voice. I'm like, okay, mom, breathing check, daily breathing check. <laughs> Uh, but in in the meanwhile, I I hand her the phone. I hand my son, my four year old son, the phone, and he picks up grandma. And he's like, "Hi, grandma, let's go talk over here." And he's like, literally walking her around the house. This is my dinosaur. And I, I mean, how could you not feel connected when a four year old is showing you his dinosaur via via you know whatever FaceTime or whatever? Um, oh, so I mean, I think my point would be that there are ways to establish that sort of connection that. Um, allow it to persist even though we can't get hugs, right? Um, and, and, and fortunately that might just be the reality right now, but I, I don't think anyone would argue that's the ideal scenario, but yeah. there are still ways to feel connected. And Dr. Carlisle, you, you teased this uh, loneliness syllabus, which I'm very anxious to see. So will that just be posted? Oh, perfect. You just posted it in the chat so everybody can read it. So now we have a few questions. I wanna get to those and not monopolize all the questions. Um, and so, oh, this is a good question from Larry Crane. He asks that the viral pandemic may not have induced loneliness in the main population, but how has it affected the elderly, especially those living alone or even in conglomerate living? Well, I'll just let you guys jump in, whoever can. Address. I can speak to this a little bit. I, I think, so there was a recent study um, of loneliness during the pandemic that, uh, I, published uh, about a month ago. And of course, it's still early, so it's hard to say definitively what, what uh, even has played out uh, to date. Um, but especially in uh, older Americans, uh, what seems to have happened is that um, their loneliness increased in the early stages of the pandemic, um, not to a huge degree, but, but detectably. Uh, around March and early April, probably when um, it was seen as imperative that, that uh, elderly individuals isolate from everyone else, basically. Um, and then uh, into April um, and May, when stay-at-home orders began to be issued and the whole population essentially was kind of quarantined to a degree, um, that leveled off and older individuals um, stopped essentially being as lonely or uh, as they were in March. And I, I suspect maybe that um, when everybody kind of, um, we just kind of figured it out and, and started getting in touch with everybody virtually. Uh, and that may have led to a, a decrease then in some of the loneliness that spiked in, in March. Um, so it kind of has changed a little bit over the year. 
Wonderful. Um, I have a question for Dr. Sumner. This is from Bria Woods. She says, I miss your classes. One thing I've noticed during Hi, the Bria. <laughs> is that I have more time and space to hold an audience with myself. I'm relearning how to enjoy my own company. For everyone on the panel, what are some ways I can make my social time with myself more fruitful, hopefully staving off feelings of extreme loneliness? What a beautiful question. This, um, somebody taught you well, I'm just joking. <laughs> uh, many people taught her well at Trinity. Um, so one of the things that you actually picked up on is the idea that um, sometimes we do use technology when we're bored. It's, simply, it's, like a, it's been called like a cycle of boredom, the sense of like, I'm bored and I, I, I don't like sitting with myself because sitting with yourself and your own emotions can feel very uncomfortable. So we find something to distract ourselves and kind of use that cycle, right? Um, I think right now, the best thing that, that folks can do kind of is be proactive. Again, noting that people aren't going to come and knock on your door and you're not going to just go to the places you normally go, whether that's a restaurant, a bar, your friends, a sporting event, whatever it is, those places that will fit your needs, they're not going to magically show up. Um, we actually have to put more um, concerted effort into being strategic about what we do. And there's all sorts of funny ways to do this. It's not that hard, right? You just have to, you have to send a text. You have to set up the Zoom call. I mean, over the holidays, uh, a lot of people are worried about how their um, normal patterns of, of experiencing the holidays will be disrupted in a similar way. Similar way. And again, my, my tip there is make plans. Simply make the plan and do it. Right. And, and, and it's funny because we seem to think that we can't make plans and do things anymore, but we can. They, they need to be virtual. But an example I just heard of was somebody who normally um, on Thanksgiving, they always watch Christmas vacation with their family. They set up a, net, uh, a Netflix or whatever viewing party with their family and they all watched it. They all made fudge. They all ate popcorn, just like they do every single year via this. Um, the funniest example is I have a, a friend who they usually have a ping pong tournament like a family ping pong tournament over Thanksgiving. And his grandmother was very, very upset that there was gonna be no ping pong. So much so that she cold emails, um, I'm blanking on his name. He's a New York Times crossword puzzle guy, very well known. He's been in movies and shows and all sorts of things. And grandma straight cold emails this guy asking for how she can do virtual ping pong for her family. He agrees it's a bad idea. But the funny thing is that, you know, that the connection that her family would have gotten, the sense of cohesion that they would have gotten via playing ping pong, as in like, we all just show up at grandma's house and we don't have plans, but we'll play ping pong at some point and I'm sure it'll be fun. Instead, they have like, truly, that's an epic story. <laughs> the time that grandma, you know, I mean, that that's going to be in family legend for years. And what's funny is all of them started sharing it on Twitter. One of them, had it uh, wrote a story that was published in the local newspaper. I mean, th this spread in ways that I, I, I think they experienced connection in, again, a, a probably greater sense than they probably would have had they just gone and played ping pong. So I guess my overall tip for that, and um, also I see Jane's comment down there, uh, make plans, do things. Don't just sit down and wait and hope that things will come to you. you send the email if, if you want to set up something, right? A, a Zoom conversation with friends, uh, Dr. Ellison, you mentioned, like you didn't used to have Zoom conversations with your, your college buddies. And now you do because someone set it up and said, hey, let's all get on this Zoom chat, right? Um, and you have to be more proactive. You just do. Would either of you like to add to that before I ask the next question? Yes, Dr. Carlisle. So, um, I noticed too, besides like all those, those great ways to be interactive with, with other people and making plans that Dr. Sumner described, Bria also asked about like socializing with herself. Like I think making, making the time on her own and no one has, no student has taken me up on this, but I know a little bit about Bria and I bet she would. Um, be the next Samuel Pepys while you're on your own and, and write this experience and write a diary so much of our culture is digital and ephemeral right now. Like I don't, and, 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 and so much of it is, is, is also visual, right? And so like, write, write those experiences and those crazy lovely details about like what you're hoarding in your pantry or not, or what you can't find in the grocery store or, or what people, how people are reacting in this way, because, you know, 400 years from now, someone really might need that. So that's what I would say. Oh, Dr. Carlisle, an English for writing professor to the core. <laughs> that's wonderful. Um, okay. I think it's also important to note uh, quickly, the flip side of this loneliness conversation with the pandemic is that I overheard a conversation um, from eight feet back at the grocery store checkout. And, and the, the people in front of me were complaining about the fact that their family won't go away. 
And it was really interesting conversation because it makes sense. And it's one that many of you listening to actually relate to more. And again, the idea that everyone's experiencing this pandemic in their own unique situation. And there are a lot of people who are living alone and feeling more lonely as a result. There are also people who are used to having their own time and their own space. And suddenly they're in a living quarters confined with these people that they love so much saying, will you go away and leave me alone because you're here all the time. And there's a concept for it. it's called the paradox of affection. And we love affection, but we can also feel smothered, like literally suffocated in affection. Mm -hmm. um, and but the comment there that you mentioned, um, Dr. Kyle Hill, but noting it, it made me think of the fact that like many people need to know that, that to you, right? Whatever your experiences are, your experiences. Um, I think statistical significance is something that you've probably heard Dr. Ellison and I both mention. It's a very blunt instrument that, you know, gets that probability of this study being found in the population but it doesn't get at individual experiences in the way that Dr. Carlisle you know, mentioned, the idea that everyone's gonna have their own colorful experiences and the statistics cut across that without necessarily getting into what each person feels and every person feels different. We have a wonderful question from a high school teacher, Jane Manock. She writes that I teach high school, mostly 12th graders. So many are clearly lonely, especially those who've been virtual since March. I don't know how to help them over Zoom. Zoom, that's all the connection I get to have. I can't read body language well, especially if their cameras are off. What can I do to help my students? What activities or advice could I give? Thank you, because I have a 12th grader in my house and I feel this so much, exactly what you're saying. I don't know how to help. And they have been home since March and it does feel, it's, it's excruciating to watch somebody feel lonely like that. Any words of wisdom? Yes, Dr. Carlyle. I don't know if they're wisdom and, and Dr. Ellison and Dr. Sumner living in the world of statistics will, you know, well, they, will, they won't because they're too polite. They'll, they'll recognize this as just anecdotal. Um, but there was an article recently and I forget where and I wish I knew it, but it was a teacher who just finished teaching um, a college class and she was so convinced she hadn't connected to her students or done anything or made a difference at all. And when she got her evaluations, it turned out that quite the opposite was true, that, that students were getting more than, than she realized and more connection out of those classes than she realized. And so, you know, I don't, I would love to brainstorm with, with a high school teacher to think of activities, but I, I'm drawing a blank right now, except for writing, right? Write each other letters, I don't know. But, but I did want to offer that consolation that you may very well be making a bigger difference and connecting them and helping them to feel less lonely than you realize. I would say this, I would actually not disagree in the slightest bit. Um, I, continuing to show up, right? Continuing to be there to reach out in personalized ways. Um, some students ex are experiencing, again, the monotony of just logging on and being a, an anonymous box. Don't let them be anonymous. Reach out, know their names, know their stories, um, you know, as much as you can. That's, you can't always do that entirely. But just, I mean, as an example, I had a, a student miss an, a test that was unlike them. They turned in everything. So I, I emailed. Of course I emailed. What else would I do, right, during normal times? I did the same thing I would normally do. And the student was so shocked that I remembered and, and knew them enough to know that that was unusual. Well, of course, it's not that, you know, it's a normal normal reaction. Um, so I think a lot, of, a lot of the things that we can do is just continuing to show up. Um, also noting that, you know, being, being a 12th grader is an odd time anyway. 12th graders have always, that's always been a hard time. <laughs> like high school, I mean, kind of like when people talk about like high school as, you mentioned like they're always on their phones and stuff like that and they don't know what it, what it looks like to look someone in the eye. I, I don't recall having long conversations with the elders in my life where I looked them in the eye and poured out my feelings when I was a teenager, right? That's always kind of like kind of a, a time that I'm not sure ever really existed. We were always distracted in various ways, right? Um, so, I mean, it, it, again, it's an, not the ideal scenario. Of course, I would rather be in the classroom, but we can still connect and simply I think as, as Kelly said, knowing that um, says a lot for the students, I think. I would just, a third strategy might be, um, even if you don't personalize a message, just, just saying into the void, if their cameras aren't on and you can't see if their body language indicates they're struggling, just saying, I know some of you are having a hard time. And, and if, if it's your style, you might self-disclose a little bit to say it's hard on, on me too. And, and this is something I've been doing with my own students and they, they do seem to appreciate it and, and value 
um, just a, an openness to um, having a conversation about that. Um, but I agree, it's, I mean, as a, um, an instructor too, uh, doing classes with Zoom, it's just uh, very difficult to make that connection or just more so than usual. Mm -hmm. um, but I think just, just being open in general um, and, and um, broadcasting your willingness to, ha to have that conversation is, is helpful. Wonderful. And I think we just have time for one last question. There's a, a few that are in, in the queue still. Um, Beth Fenger asks, has there been any research or findings on the impact of personality, um, MBTI and others such as, uh, I'm not even sure how to say that, on feelings of loneliness and what do those feel findings show? Um, sounds like more of a technical question. Maybe Dr. Ellison, can you speak to some of this? Sure, I, I'd um, be happy to. I'm, um, I know a little about personality and I, I, I know, for example, that um, feelings of loneliness are connected to personality, especially to individual differences in personality. Um, so people who um, are uh, high in the personality dimension called neuroticism, or uh, another way of saying as low in emotional stability, also tend to be um, prone to loneliness. Um, I suppose maybe obviously people who are very extroverted tend to be uh, um, low in loneliness, just they don't feel lonely as often as people who are introverted. Um, so yeah, there, there are lots of connections um, to personality. And as I mentioned before, it really goes deep to who we are and how we've figured out how to make connections to people. Mm -hmm. um, so there are certainly um, a lot of individual differences there. Now, before we wrap up, I wanted to ask each of the panelists if there is final thing you'd like to share that we haven't been able to get through a strategy or something, a personal story even, um, that we haven't been able to get to. Feel free to chime in. I'll start by answering. I see Larry's question at the bottom, oh, okay. and I think that's actually okay. a good point for me to quickly address as my last part. Um, how do portions of the population without technology deal with social isol isolation? Oh. That's a really great question. It's important to re remember there are remain digital divides, and not everyone is uh, online in the sense that many assume. Um, at the same time, I would push that a technology is a letter. A technology is a phone call. Actually, there was some research showing that phone calls are skyrocketing. The phone, nobody was calling anymore. And then the pandemic happened and people wanted to call uh, in some ways because they were reaching people in, in ways that they could, right? Mm -hmm. So I would say continue to find the, the technologies that you do have. And that might be a pen and paper. That might be a telephone. Wonderful. It doesn't have to be fancy. You don't have to look for fancy solutions and the, and the newest, you know, you don't have to go on TikTok to connect. You just need to pick up a way to, to connect, right? And I, I really like Dr. Sunner's advice, uh, just to be proactive and to look for ways to connect to people that you might not have thought of before, but um, really anything's on the table. I mean, people will understand it's 2020 and it's a, a sort of a crazy time. So you're, you might as well reach out in ways that um, you, know, you might not have thought of. Um, and I think people will generally appreciate it. So that, that's my advice is to just leap out there and, and see what connections you can make. Dr. Kral. Um, jumping on that idea of leaping out there and going, um, seeing what connections you can make. Um, two years ago, I spent a year in a cathedral community in England and doing research on this cathedral. And one of the, there was a huge volunteer community and there were very many lonely people who had mental illness or poverty that also just come out and hang out at the cathedral and go away. And it took me a long time to understand what they would get out of that. And then I read about a study that, that very shallow, but regular social interactions, like what you have with your bus driver or the waitress at the cafe or the tour guide at the cathedral actually really contribute to um, our feelings of connection. And so I just wanted to say like, go outside and like have those, those very shallow interactions with your mask on six feet away on bike paths or, places talk to people at the grocery store. I think that can have a very technology-free, unmediated connection to human beings, even if it's just very shallow and quick. Oh, excellent, excellent thoughts. I hope everyone who's tuned in enjoyed, enjoyed this webinar as much as I have. 
And for additional learning together content, including other webinars, podcasts, and book club information, you can visit the lifelong learning page on the alumni website. You can see the address on your screen. It's trinity.edu slash alumni slash learn dash grow. Our next webinar is scheduled for January 19th at 6.30 p.m. Central Time. And the discussion is going to be on chaos or conspiracy, thinking about conspiracy theories in the time of polarization. You can stay tuned for more information on that coming your way. And again, thank you guys for all participating, showing up, for our amazing faculty, for giving us a sense of connection to the broader Trinity community and helping us all feel a little less lonely tonight. Thank you. <laughs>